Good morning. Great to see you. It's February, the month of love. Gentlemen, that means you have 24 hours before tomorrow, Valentine's Day. It's not too late. Go get you something good for your lady. Okay? Just saying a little friendly advice. By the way, today, uh, just give a little warning. Uh, it's going to be some PG-13 scriptures. So mom, dad, just that's the warning. I told you it was coming. Uh, today is your day. <laughs> I'm fired up. Um, today, we're going to go back and study one of my all-time absolute favorite love stories. It's not a love story like you expect, though. It's a different kind of love story. It's going to be in John chapter 8. You can go ahead and turn there. Um, it's one of the most powerful examples of love and forgiveness that, frankly, it's done on a level that only Jesus could do. It's that powerful. It is that profound. In fact, it's so straightforward. This is one of the rare times it doesn't even need setup. I don't have to give it an introduction or context. We're just going to dive straight in. John chapter 8. Go ahead and pull up your favorite Bible app if you're following along or if you're watching at home. Great to have you with us. We're going to read verses uh, 1 through 11. I'm going to read from the NLT today. Follow along. It says, Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives. But early the next morning, he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered. They always gathered. And he sat down and he taught them. And as he was speaking... The teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. You know what that means? Okay, all right, okay, caught in the act of adultery. And they put her in front of the crowd. Picture this, guys. Think about what we're reading. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something that they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down, and he wrote in the dust with his finger. And they kept on demanding an answer. So he stood up again, and he says, okay, all right, all right. Tell you what, let the one who has never sinned throw that first stone. And then he stooped down, and he began to write in the dust again. Some say he was maybe writing the sins of some of those around him who were ready with these stones. And I love what happens next in verse 9. When the accusers heard this... They slipped away. It's like, hmm. It's, can you just picture, like, slinking away? Beginning with the oldest, till only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again, and he said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, he said. And Jesus said, Neither do I. I love that. But so many people stop there. And I can understand why, right? Because if you stop there, it ends on this high note. Jesus has shown up. He's rescued someone who's in distress. He's offered forgiveness. He restores her dignity. He's like, woo, that's good. Let's go to Sizzler. We're done here. But that's not the end of the story, you know? We love everything to be wrapped up in 22 minutes like a sitcom, eight minutes with commercials. You can skip through those now, right? But Jesus doesn't stop there. He has five more words to say, five more words that are equally full of love and equally full of truth. He says this, go and sin no more. Your translation may say, go and leave your life of sin. Or more to the point, go, but stop your sinning. A few years ago, uh, it was the last time we were in John chapter 8, I asked us, what does it mean to actually speak the truth in love today? And following the example of Jesus, I asked this gigantic question. If true love actually speaks... Can we afford to stay silent in a culture of confusion? Can we? Because people are looking for answers. They're looking for truth. I love Lisa Bevere, the great best-selling author, international speaker. She writes this. She says, if you walk into most churches nowadays, you'll likely hear a message of love and hope and encouragement. And that is all well and good. After decades of overly harsh messages, the pendulum has naturally swung to the other side. But have we swung it too far? Have we become so seeker-friendly that we now neglect what it means to actually be a true friend to those who walk through our doors? Now, the mistake we made in the previous decades was to tell the truth, but do it in ways that weren't always loving. But she says, the answer to this, though, isn't to shrink back from speaking the truth. It's to learn how to speak the truth in love, like Jesus. 
Jesus was absolutely a friend of sinners, a true friend. And we have to be too. But from time to time, I think it's always a great idea to make sure we come back to the standard to know what does a true friend actually look like? Not like my opinion or your opinion. What from this book? What is a true friend? Because I'm going to be honest. I, I need, I expect my friends to tell me the truth. I need that. Don't you? I don't want them to coddle my feelings. Okay? It may offend me. It may make me temporarily mad. But I'm, if I am headed towards a cliff and you know it, I expect you to give me a heads up. I, I'm counting on that. It might annoy me. But if you are right and I needed to know that, then you are being a true friend. You know, we've all had people come and bang people over the head with it. I need people to tell me things I need to hear, but I need it in a loving way. And when I first met Amy, this beautiful blonde sitting on the front row taking notes furiously on this great sermon, she came up to me, and we, we could not be more different. She was way over here on the mercy and grace side. Just, ah, just love the world. Let's go hug a tree, right? And I was way over here on the justice and truth side, right? See everything crystal clear, black and white. If you can't, you're dumb, right? It was just, that was it. And if she, I, I just speak, I'm glad some of you guys didn't know me back then. She, if she ever had a friend that was maybe sliding into a dangerous territory, or maybe even sin, her, her rebuke would be so incredibly soft, so loving, it would almost feel like a, like a gentle kiss on a summer's morn, right? You're just like, oh, that's so sweet. You know, if she had to use like a, like a, a weapon to kind of define this, I would say this, this would be her hammer. It's, Little, little tap, tap. You know, it's a multi-tool, too. Like, you, got, you, you, need, you need your eyebrows tweezed? I got tweezers. We got all kinds of stuff we can do. Hey, hey you know what? Maybe a, just, let's just hug it out, okay? Super soft, super gentle. Me, on the other hand, if I wanted to come and rebuke you, <laughs> this is me. Justice and truth, baby. You know, here it comes. This is, this is what we do. You got an issue? You know what? I was like... I, I, I might have been right, but I was wrong. You know what I'm saying? I would come up to people, I'd be like, listen, what you're doing is wrong. Put your purse down, go park your purse, you know? I mean, you get your Prius out, whatever you do. Take your tree hugging, latte sipping, skinny jean wearing, fake man bun clip on, and go to the altar and get saved. You need Jesus, snowflake. Right? Seriously, right? Strong on justice. <laughs> Slightly lacking in love. Just a little bit, okay? We've all been on the receiving end of this, and it doesn't feel very good. And sometimes the church has been guilty of that, slightly lacking in love. But have we pulled back to where we're no longer willing to even share the truth? Anybody remember Gallagher with his sledgehammer, <laughs> with his sledgematic? Like the front rows, they would all come wearing ponchos. Like the first two, like, Ruthie, you'd be cut. Like, this is what he would do. He'd take the watermelon, and he would just take his hammer, and whammo, that was what he would do, and it would cover everybody. On this side of knowing my wife and having her smooth out, but I wonder if this is how I was with truth. I wonder if I was Gallagher, you know, minus the great hair that he used to have. But thankfully, somebody cared enough to speak the truth to me in love. She boldly but gently, lovingly said, truth is great. Sweetie, I love how you know it. I love how you stand on God's truth. But you don't have to wield it like a weapon. You don't have to wield it like a club. Every one of us have been on the receiving end of truth given without love. And sometimes truth without love just feels mean. Here's the flip side. Love without truth is meaningless. Because you need both. You must have both. That's what Jesus will. Look at Jesus. We see these two beautiful qualities on full display. He is the God who so loved the world. He is that. But just a few chapters later in John 14, 16, he would literally say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now think about what we just read. The woman caught in the act of adultery. How do the religious people treat her? Did you ever catch that? It says the teachers and the religious law, the Pharisees, they bring her out in front of the crowd, and they all show her such love and compassion. They kneel down beside her. They take off their garments, and they cover her up, and they restore her dignity and say, sweetie, can I get you a Diet Coke? Is there anything you need? No, I didn't do any of that. It says they bring her out, and they put her fully exposed in front of the crowd, surrounded by these self-righteous accusers who want to stone her. Okay, for the younglings in the crowd, that's not like throwing little pebbles at people. Okay? It's bam, bam. It's huge, huge 
bold. It is a death sentence. They literally want to stone her, but thankfully, Jesus is there. Jesus steps in, thankfully, and he stands there, and he says to all those condemning, hey, I hear you, okay, I'll tell you what, I know the law of Moses says that. Let the first one who has no sin hurl away. <laughs> What's that? I love how the oldest were the ones that dropped the stones first, walk away. Almost like they've lived long enough to know, <laughs> I know I ain't perfect. I should probably just slip away into the bushes. <laughs> Jesus was there. One by one, the older ones walk away, and in this moment of beautiful grace, Jesus turns to her and says, Woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir. And he says, Neither do I condemn you. And it is simply awe-inspiring. What an amazing display of love and grace and beauty, all wrapped up in this powerful moment. The God of eternity reaches down into the dust of our existence, and transforms it with a single touch. But if Jesus had the attitude of a lot of people today, that's where the story would end. But thankfully it doesn't, because his love goes further. And as beautiful as those words are, neither do I condemn you, his next words are equally full of grace and love and truth. Go and leave your life of sin. So in a day of confusion, can you even define sin? When the church is so lukewarm, people don't even talk about it. I mean, in case, let's just assume maybe you're new to the faith. You're kind of checking this thing out. Let, let's just look and see. Just, just a sampling of how God's word defines sins, okay? Here's just a few from 1 Corinthians. You can read along. Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or abusive or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. All right, stop right there. If you look at that list, okay, so none of us can be self-righteous. Every one of us is covered under this list. Every, but for the grace of God, there go us, right? We're not judging anybody. I mean, at the very least, I know you've been greedy. Don't you say you haven't. You've taken more brownies than you should have. You know it. And you look at somebody's other thing. You may not be what we consider some of the big ones, but we're going to look and see what unrighteousness is in God's eyes. All right? So we're all in this together. That list is the bad news. But keep reading. There's good news. Verse 11 says, some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ, and by the Spirit of our God. So don't miss that last part. That's how some of you were. Jesus came to set us free from what we think is the best. He says, neither do I condemn you, but then says, now go and leave your life of sin. Why? Why does Jesus say that? It's because he wants the best for her. He knows she has been drinking from a well that is dry and empty and will never quench her thirst for purpose and love, and acceptance. You know people who are doing that. You know, it, maybe it's you. But for the grace of God, there go I, filling everything in this hole in our heart with stuff that won't touch it, only Christ. His desire for her is that she run fully into the identity that he has created for her. He knows she's been living in ways that are far under God's best. He has so much better in store. Do you see what's happening here? His encounter with her is an invitation to more. He's calling her out of her sin and saying, I have something breathtakingly beautiful for your future. And that's one thing I love about our Savior. One thing that's great about Jesus is Jesus loves us right where we are, but he never leaves us where we are. Aren't you glad? He cares enough not to leave us in our own mess. He calls us into life. He calls us, we run out of that grave, those chains, that body. He's always pointing us towards his best, towards his design. My question is, as the modern day church, are we doing the same? Are we willing to boldly speak the truth in love to a hurting and dying world that needs to hear it? I mean, can we, let me ask this a more honest question. I'm just gonna put it out there. Do we even know this book enough to even recognize truth? Because the world is erasing these lines and coloring and everything. Is, there's, no, there's no absolutes anymore. It's just endless shades of gray. And I wonder, can we even differentiate between truth and a lie today? If we can't, then are we really good followers of Christ? Are we really good disciples? 
Just a little further over in the Gospel of John, Jesus would literally go on to say this. If you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. Then you'll know the truth, and the truth will put you in chains. It says the truth will make you free. Did you catch that? Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say, if you water down my teaching, then you're really my disciples. Or if it offends you and you want to redefine my teaching, that's cool too. He doesn't say that. He says, if you hold to my teaching, then you'll know it. So apparently not only can we know the truth, we, we will know the truth if we are really his disciples. When we wonder what's right and wrong, this is where we come. We don't go to Dr. Phil. We don't take a poll. We don't see what our buddies say. We go here to the owner's manual. We say, what does it say? Psalm 33, 4 says, the word of the Lord is right. It is truth. So you have Christ, the truth teller, versus Satan, who is the liar. He loves to confuse people. He is the author of confusion. Not God. Satan is. Jesus himself said, you are the father of lies. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. In fact, there is no truth in him. When he lies, that's what he does. He's speaking his native tongue. I can almost see like a snake tongue from the serpent flickering out. That's what he does. You know how you can tell the devil's lying? His lips are moving, right? He is talking. So what about you? Can you recognize truth? If someone were to come and say, hey, I've got, got some confused. I've got so many youth coming up to me saying, I'm so confused. I'm being told that I've got to recognize truth. I've got to pretend and play make-believe with certain people. I don't understand what's going on. Is this right? Should we, you know, what do we do? Where, where's the love in this? Can you recognize when the enemy is trying to erase protective boundaries? Are you teaching those? His commandments, they're guardrails. They're to prevent us from pain, to prevent us from going off the... I, I love this comic. I try to share this every couple of years where he says, I hate being confined by this fence. God's word is just too much. Wait, it's not a fence. It's a guardrail. And he goes over the edge. Y'all, this is so prophetic today. I look around and I see people who are confused about things they should not be confused about. And a lot of it is because we have stayed silent. God's word's not silent about these things. It's us. I read an article from Dale Hudson. He's a great uh, youth pastor, a children's pastor for 28 years. And he says this. He says, guys, I'm seeing an interesting new thing. There's buzzwords going around, things like choose your own pronouns. And among the younger parents, I'm not allowed to refer to their child by any particular gender. And if they have a baby, they don't want you to know. They call it a baby so that you can just pick things. He says, the goal is to live a life that is completely devoid of gender. No constraints by God. We see people who come into the class so confused right now. Middle schoolers, he's seeing it in his youth group. High schoolers coming in, now identifying as neither male nor female, instead choosing to call themselves non-binary. Some kids choosing to jump back and forth between the two, sometimes in the same week. One may dress as a boy one day, demand to be called him, and just days later show up dressed as a girl, demanding to be called her, as he follows your daughter into the girl's locker room. And I read this, I think, you know, this, we, would, we would say this is absolute lunacy just 10 years ago. We said, there's no way this would happen. No way. I said, I want this guy's overreact. So I did what every great pastor does. I googled it and I found an article that says today there are now up to 27 genders that children can choose from today. Y'all remember choose your own adventure books growing up? Yeah. You want to talk about choosing your own adventure? Think about this. 27 genders. But I say this with all the love in the world. That's not what God's word says. That's not what God's word says. God's word says very clearly he created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Never forget this. We are made in his image. In fact, you are his image bearers to a lost world. You are supposed to carry his image, created specifically. Male and female, perfect compliments, exquisitely created by a loving creator, knit together in the womb, he knew you, intricately designed to come together. I don't need to be any more graphic than that to come together for the procreation and sustaining of the human race. 
This is so straightforward. So when we see this, not only is this a union, it's supposed to be a sacred, holy covenant of marriage, but it's also a biblical design for the continuing of life. And it's also simple science. It's biology 101. It always cracks me up to hear Christians made fun of and mocked as people of blind faith who just reject science. Oh, you're so backwards and uneducated. You, you reject science. Just follow. Okay, let's look at the science. Science tells us that God created us with either an XY chromosome or XX chromosomes. There's no ambiguity. He designed our parts to fit together perfectly. Just as recently as a few years ago, this didn't even need to be stated. But look at how far we've drifted from what was commonly known as truth. And we have children coming up and saying, I don't know if I need to call this person Alex or Alexa. I used to play football with him. And today he's wearing a dress and wearing a bra, and he's demanding we all accommodate him. Do I have to make believe and pretend? What would you say? You can judge him, or you can lovingly come alongside him and say, you know what? What does God's word say about this? Because here's one standard of truth that doesn't change. And I love you. And I'm not here to judge you. We have family members that deal with this. You do too. There's no, there's no hatred here. There's nothing but wanting to put God's standard up as the, the goal that we are aiming for. That's what it's about. When we look at this, guys, if we do not state the truth, it will be harder and harder to find it if we don't speak up. If you do not clearly and lovingly wade through this confusion. All right, let me ask you a question. I'm going to date some of you. Does anybody remember MTV when it actually played music videos? Anybody? Right? Oh, those are the good old days. One of the greatest bands after Striper and after Journey was a band named Genesis. Anybody remember Genesis? They had a song called Land of Confusion. Anybody remember this? Mm. Can't you see this is the land of confusion? This is the world we live in. Oh. Right? It goes on. You know, you're going to sing it the rest of your day. Okay? Land of confusion, folks. We're there. We are living in a land of confusion. When we don't hold to the truth, when we are not willing to speak this, our children are being done a huge disservice. And we can't be surprised when they're lost in a land of confusion. Many children will grow up confused about what shouldn't be confusing. It's not their fault. That's on us. Are we willing to hold up the standard of truth? Or are you silent? You know, the world is telling them, guys, we got to be ready for this. They're telling them there's no consequences for your choices. Make no mistake, they are saying there's no consequence. Listen, if you want to ignore the owner's manual, be your own God, just you know, explore anything you like. Take risks, be open-minded. Who cares what your creator designed you to be? Ignore God. You know what? You decide what's best. Be your own God. If you want to deviate from God's best design, go for it. If you want to ignore the owner's manual, no problem. There's no consequences for that. If you want to ignore the owner's manual of your new Ferrari that you just bought, when it clearly says, hey, it takes 93 octane. And you say, what, what does he know about how he built his car? I'm putting maple syrup in it. <laughs> maple syrup is sweet. It's gooey. Everybody loves that, right? And what, what could the Ferrari maker possibly know about his Ferrari? I know what's better. And I'm, by golly, going to put maple syrup in to run my vehicle. You see what I'm saying? What could the owner possibly know about the creators? The creations are his, right? How, how could he possibly know? But do you see what we're saying? When we come uncoupled from his standard, then it's anything goes. Who's to say what is right or wrong? Listen, if you want to rewrite his word to define love between two men as a God-honoring, sanctified marriage, just do it. Do it. If you want to redefine his concept of holy matrimony, go for, be free. Be free. Love is love, right? Who are you to judge? Just be free. We can all be like Buddy the Elf and declare, I'm in love, I'm in love, and I don't care who knows it. And then we throw our hat, like Mary Tyler Moore. Guys, it's a new progressive day, and the world is saying you are free from the consequences. And to that, I, with all the love in the world, say, no, sir. That is not truth. You know what that is? 
That's feelings. And feelings are not the same as truth. Your feelings will lie. My feelings lie. They change one day to the next. And if you're honest, so do yours. That's why we have truth. God is not the author of confusion. You know who the author of confusion is? The enemy, Satan. He loves to come and kill and steal and destroy. God, I want to be clear. I want to say that okay, we're not just bashing one set of people or another set. Adultery is wrong, and it is not God's plan for your best life. You need to hear that. Don't give up and walk away and say, ah, I messed up. Let's just try somebody else and just keep going through the registry here. You need to hear that. Fornicating, cohabitating outside of marriage, premarital sex, even if it's heterosex and you think you love the person, that is wrong and it is not God's best for your life. It's based on his word. Do we miss that standard? Sure, we do. But it doesn't change the standard. And I'm just going to go out on a limb. I'm out here. Let's just saw it off. I know it's not politically correct. Practicing homosexuality is not God's plan or your best life based on his design for the population and procreation, for you to follow the command, populate the planet, subdue the earth, and make it yours. His first command. Think about this. This used to be so clear. God is so clear in his word. Maybe you're new and you've just never really heard this, so let's just check it out. This is just one passage that hits all of us. Starting in Romans 1, 18, it says this. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. All right, y'all told you it's going to get PG-13? Here you go. Get ready. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God and even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and, what's that word? Confused. Claiming to be wise. We're so wise and erudite and progressive today. We, do, we, we know what's best. By claiming to be wise, they actually became utter fools. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshipped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself the one who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men. And as a result of this sin, they suffered within them the penalty they deserved. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking. And he let them do things that should never be done. Read this next line carefully. They invent new ways of sinning. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die. Yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. Now, for full context on this, there's a whole list of sins that have nothing to do with sexuality that are in this, this long passage, okay? So when he's saying those who deserve to die, he's not talking about just sexual things. He's saying sin in total. Every one of us, we know the wages of sin is death. We have separated ourselves from a holy God, okay? So lest anyone get self-righteous, that's all of us. We need a Savior. Ain't none of us got it all together. Okay, so hear that. Hear that in Paul's admonition here. Your translation of that last verse, they literally say they even applaud those who sin or they celebrate it. Church, that's where we are today. What do we do? That's where we are today, where things are openly celebrated. Do you sin? Yeah. Do I sin? Yeah. Here's the difference. I would never ask you to celebrate my sin. God have mercy on me if I demand you condone my sin to make me feel safe. That's not love. If I'm asking you to pretend that everything I'm doing is blessed by God, and I'm silent about it, am I really 
being a disciple of Christ, when I'm withholding what I know is true, I'm not saying be ugly or be mean or get out the sledgehammer. You don't have to judge anybody. God's word does that. It spanks me every day. And I need it to. It's what makes me a follower of Christ. None of us are without sin. But I don't ask you to condone it or celebrate it. You know what I want? I want you to help me come back to the Lord and follow his best plan of holiness and purity. Help me repent. God can and will redeem anyone. No one is beyond his love. Every one of us need forgiveness and hope and healing. The great news is this. There's hope. There's healing. There's purpose according to his perfect design. If we follow his owner's manual, the car runs best. All right, so I'm going to bring us back to how this started, okay? I want to remind everyone. The goal of this series is simply this, to remind us all what God's standard is so that we can remember what we're aiming for. This is it, right? It's not my opinion. It's not your opinion. It's not the culture's opinion. What does God's word say? Okay, so if you're mad at me, don't shoot the messenger. I'm just showing you this is the standard. If we claim to be people of the book, here we go, okay? Will you fall short? Mm, you might. Does it change the standard? No. It's still truth. You may not like it. I may not like it. But it doesn't change the truth. Here's the reality, okay? As Satan and those who oppose God's standard continue to impose this gender blurring and all kinds of squishiness everywhere, those who believe simple, obvious truths, like God created the male and female, you must be prepared to share the truth that people need to hear. You must be willing to do that, to know that your identity is hidden in Christ in the midst of constantly changing values. I want to give you a warning, okay? Heads up. Do not expect the world to applaud. Do not expect people who might be trapped in sin to have their first reaction be, thank you so much. It'd be great if it was. The world will not applaud holiness. They didn't applaud Jesus. Why would we be shocked that they don't applaud us when we adhere to his law? When we follow, when we lovingly and, and full of grace say, listen, there's a better way. Do not expect the world to applaud. That's okay. You're not seeking the applause of man. You know what you're seeking? You're seeking the favor of God. You won't stand before your buddies on judgment day. You'll stand before a holy God. He's the one you need to be concerned about. I love this quote. It's so old. George Orwell said this. Look how prophetic this is. He says, the further a society drifts from truth, the more it will hate those who speak it. Anybody experience this? Anybody see this happening? It is so prophetic. And the people who are, who are loudly pushing for choose your own pronouns and be who you are and whatever you want. Man, I get it. It sounds awesome. Who doesn't want total freedom? But that's the lie of the devil. The devil came and said, listen, you don't, you don't have to answer to God. Just eat that fruit. Do what you want. You'll be like him. There's no consequences, said the one who's condemned for eternity in a lake of fire. Do we see this? You have to pull back and pull the curtain back and look through the lies and say, Satan is a liar. Every time Jesus came, he was so clear about his father's design. One man, one woman, ideally for life. There was never 27 genders. There was never 31 flavors. It's not Baskin Robbins. This isn't rocket surgery. This used to be simple, common, biblical sense, also known as truth. Look how far we have come and drifted in one generation. Our parents, their grandparents, they would laugh if they thought we were having to define something as simple as male and female. That's how far we have been. You know the frog in the kettle? Put the frog in the kettle. If it's boiling hot water, the frog sits it right away. Whoop, temperature's different. I'm out. And he hops right out. But if you put the frog in the kettle and it's cold water and he sits there, he adjusts to the temperature around him in this culture. And as you slowly turn the heat up, the frog doesn't sense the danger he's in. And it continues to get hotter and hotter till finally it's too late. The frog boils himself and he never saw the danger because the temperature around him dictated the temperature inside and it was deadly. Church, eyes wide open, and I might add, hearts of love wide open. People are hurting, and they're confused about things that shouldn't be confusing, things that didn't used to be confusing, and we are silent. 
you know, I got to say, when God's created order is under attack, if no one stands up, remember, true love speaks. You can't afford to stay silent in a culture of confusion anymore. As the days grow darker, will you stand up and speak the truth in love? If we don't, don't be surprised when the next generation grows up confused about things you were never confused about. Think about that. All we need for evil to triumph is just sit back, be silent, do nothing. Edmund Burke said it. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men and women to do nothing. The enemy will take it from there. If you'll just sit down and be quiet, we'll take over. Tough. Heavy. If I'm honest, I look around. I look around at the, the church worldwide. I see the body of Christ is eerily silent on a lot of things that are wrecking people's lives. Take the sexual stuff out. Things like gossip, slander, greed, selfishness, hypocrisy, infanticide, abortion, pornography. And of course the obvious stuff we've been talking about. Gender confusion, redefining God's clear definition of gender what his holy matrimony is supposed to be? Is that what truly loving people is now? Silence? So we don't offend somebody who needs to hear truth? Let me ask you a hard question, okay? Just, just you and the Lord. Don't answer out loud. Would we rather risk leaving someone in the bondage of sin than say something in love that temporarily might offend them or cause them discomfort? It's easy to do. I've been there. Maybe you have too. Have we confused loving people unconditionally with giving a blanket approval to all their actions? A lot of us have. Do we believe God's word still speaks to these things today? Remember, it's not God's word that's silent. It's us. The ambassadors for the Lord. God's word's not silent. We are. So as we talk about relationships and the confusion that's all around us, I felt like it was time to remember the standard that we're called to uphold and to remember what it is that we are aiming for as we share the truth in love. I was talking to a, a, one of our elders this morning, sharing, hey, listen, pray for me. I'm, I'm sharing some truth that I feel the devil does not want to be out there. He said, you know what? I'm glad you're doing this now before it becomes illegal to talk. As the world gets darker, as we are setting the stage one day for the Antichrist to come, when everything we read and believe in this is considered hate speech, it's coming. You already see it. You already see it in other parts of the world. Our brothers and sisters being martyred for saying, I love Jesus. This is the way, the truth, and the life. That's why I wanted to give that warning. Don't expect the world to applaud. That's okay. You're not here for the world. You're not learning their applause. You're earning his favor. We live in such a way that we hear, well done, good, and faithful servant. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to have our musicians come up. I'm going to land the plane. You made it. You made it through, okay, so you can breathe easy. I want you to know something. As your pastor, I will always do my best to share the truth in love. Always. I'm not perfect, but I will do my best. Remember, I am one sinner telling another sinner where I found grace and forgiveness. That's the point of love. We cannot shy away from sharing the truth in the name of love. Jesus never did that. Jesus was fully ready to, to share truth and love. And if we want the world to come to know the love of Jesus, we have to be like Jesus, full of love, full of compassion, and uncompromising on truth. So you know i got to ask. How are you doing with that? Remember, Jesus loves us so much that he doesn't leave you in your sin. He provides a way. Love always calls us out of brokenness into something better, into something great. Never forget, the same Jesus who we started today said, neither do I condemn you, in the same breath said, go and sin no more. Go and leave your life of sin. He doesn't just forgive our sin and remove our shame. He calls us into freedom. He breaks the chains of tyranny so that sin does not have its dominion over your life. Loving God, loving people, it's more than slogans right there on that wall. It's our calling. 
And if I withhold the truth from someone I love, I wonder what's the problem. God is relentless in his love. He won't settle for anything less, and we shouldn't either. We have to know our identity. It's in him. There's no confusion with God. He created each one of you with a purpose to be exactly who he designed you to be. We know that identity. We see it in scripture. And anytime we deviate from his plan, anytime, it's always negative. There's always something less that we come. Anytime you change the instructions, anytime you deviate from the recipe, it's always a little different than what the owner's manual said. We have to stand firm in our identity, guys. The days are getting darker. The sand is shifting. People are redefining what used to be commonly known as truth. I want to share this beautiful story here. It's very short, but this is so perfect for our identity. There was an elderly man. I believe he was 89 years old. He was rushing to the hospital, or rushing to his doctor's appointment. It's 8 o'clock in the morning, and he had to go see his doctor. And the doctor was taking his time, checking him out, doing the physical and stuff. And the man was fidgeting. And the doctor could tell he was in a hurry. And he looked at him and he said, are you in a rush? He says, yes, would you please finish this appointment? I have a very important appointment at nine and I don't want to miss it. And the doctor just kind of, kind of snickered, said, I'm so sorry, but you're retired, you're 89 years old. What could possibly be so important that you want to rush your own appointment? through this important physical. And the elderly man very proudly sat up and he said, every morning at 9 a.m., I head to the hospital to have breakfast with my wife. The doctor stood up and he says, I'm so sorry she's in the hospital. I didn't know that. What's her condition? Can you tell me? He said, my wife has Alzheimer's. She's had it for the past five years now. And she doesn't even know who I am anymore. She hasn't known who he is for some time. And the doctor looked at him and said, why do you continue to go if she has no idea who you are? The old man looked and said, because I still know who she is. That identity didn't change because of the slow goodbye, and it's cruel, and it's tough. But he knew the identity sanctity of that marriage holy matrimony it's not just a sexual thing people leave the spiritual element God in his love for the church mirrors marriage his relationship his covenant with Israel mirrors marriage it's not just about flesh there's a whole other element that people are missing you have to know the Savior to get this anything less you're missing the best God has for you every page of this book says, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. And I just want what's best. God's not a killjoy in the sky. If you're struggling with sin, man, I get it. I've been there. There's deliverance. There's hope. There's healing. I'm going to open the altar in just a minute. Maybe you have a family member you want to come pray for. Maybe you've got an issue in your, in your past that you just want to lay at the altar one more time. Maybe you've got a lost brother or sister or somebody on your street that doesn't know Jesus. Today is a great day to show love and pray for them. No one will bother you. It's not about that. If you just want to come and kneel, even if it's just 30 seconds, to give something to the Lord. Maybe you want to intercede for a diagnosis you just got this week that has rocked your world. I get it. Just be obedient. This is the highlight of our day where we can come and talk with our Heavenly Father. Maybe you want to stand just where you are when we're singing and just worship using the words that will be on the screen and just commune with your Father. God is here. Just be obedient. I'm going to invite us to stand together now. The words will be on the screen. The altar is open. Just be obedient to what God is asking you to do as we pursue his best for our life.